Good morning. So the title of my presentation is, is area-wide pest management useful, the case of citrus screening? And um, this presentation is based on uh, the work that I have been doing along with uh, Sergio Lenz at Iowa State and Pilar Usage at UF. So the presentation is basically going to be divided into three. First, I'm going to do the introduction, and I'm going to talk a bit about citrus screening, or um, HLB, the impact that is had um, or is currently having on um, in Florida. Then I'm going to move on and talk about pest mobility and area-wide pest management. I'm going to describe the data that we had available. Um, I'm going to then describe the concept, conceptual or um, theoretical um, model, then go over the analysis, and finally, uh, conclusions and policy implications. So starting with the first part, citrus green or HLB. It's a bacterial disease that affects growth in major citrus production areas. And it's caused by the Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus and affects the phloem of the trees. It is vectored by the Asian citrus psyllid or ACP and it is, as Andrew was talking, um, it is considered the most devastating citrus disease worldwide. It negatively affects yield, quality, and size of the fruit. It affects tree mortality and the cost of production. So to date, there is no treatment or management strategy uh, to cure HLB-infected trees. So what's going on in Florida? <clears throat> well, first of all, Florida is the largest orange producing state in the US. It is, in fact, the third largest um, orange producer worldwide behind Brazil and China. HLB was found in Florida in 2005, and it has uh, spread across the state quite rapidly and reached epide epidemic proportions. I conducted a survey um, in, among growers, and I found that on average, 90% of the acreage in a citrus operation for a, is infected. 80% of the trees, on average, are infected, and on average, again, um, the yield reduction has been 41% since the onset in 2005. Now, the conventional protocol to manage the disease is basically to inspect the trees for symptoms, but this could be tricky because it has a latency period that goes anywhere from six months to one year. And so symptoms are only expressed um, after this latency period is over. The second uh, part of this protocol is to control the ACP with insecticide uh, sprays, and the third, if symptoms are found, then uh, removal is recommended to uh, eliminate that inoculum, source of inoculum. The issue, though, is that in Florida, growers have been reluctant to remove the trees, and this has been mainly because just before HLB, there was a canker outbreak, and so uh, the USDA had started an er eradication program but they um, were facing issues with um, citrus um, doorback um, citrus owners that were reluctant to um, take down their trees. And so they actually started a lawsuit against the USDA and this eradication program uh, came to a halt. And so then the hurricanes hit the state and it spread all over. So what did uh, Florida growers do uh, well, they use this approach of, you know, trying to bypass this blockage of the flowing vessels by giving foliar nutrients to the trees. Um, I very much agree with the saying that uh, an image is worth, a th is worth a thousand words. So what I'm going to do next is show just a few graphs to illustrate better what the impact has been uh, of this disease in Florida. So the first graph, uh, as you can see, is orange production in Florida from 2000-2001 to um, today. And you can see that in 2003-04, production was 240 million boxes across the state. And um, you can see also the big dip that production took um, just after that. And that is because of the 2004 back-to-back hurricanes. We had Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Gene all within approximately one month. Then Wilma hit the state, and then uh, there was a freeze. So after those weather shocks hit the industry, it started to go back up, but once again, HLB was around in 2005. So even though it started to go up again, you can see the continued uh, decreasing trend in orange production. In 2015-16, um, uh, it was estimated that the state produced 80 million boxes. This year, the USDA is forecasting 71 million boxes. 
This is the lowest since, I believe, 1964. To better understand what has been going on um, in production, we can take a look at the two factors that make up for it, so barren acreage and yield. So let's take a look at that. This graph illustrates orange barren acreage in Florida. Uh, you can see total acreage is the uh, yellowish um, line. And so the peak was in 1996-97 with approximately 600,000 acres, uh, and it has been decreasing uh, ever since. Uh, today there are roughly 400,000 acres. So one third of that reduction in production is coming out of the acreage. The rest is coming from yield. So this is, illustrates the yield with the gray line measured on the um, vertical left-hand side axis. And you can see that it was 300 plus uh, boxes per acre in late 1990s, uh, the beginning of 2000s. Then again, we had the impact of the hurricanes and then um, that continued um, decreasing trend. Currently, it's about just over 200 boxes per acre. The purple bars are measured on the right-hand side vertical axis, and you can see um, they are measuring fruit drop. And basically, this doubled um, from 2006-7, 15%. Last year, it was close to 30. The other impact that I was talking about was cost of production. This uh, graph illustrates that from uh, in 2003-04, basically, uh, the, the caretaking of the growth was $800 per acre. It is currently at about $1,800 per acre, so uh, an increase of $1,000 per acre in the, in the period that we're looking at. It is interesting to see also what were the components of the caretaking programs that increased the most. And so um, I'm illustrating that change with this graph. The blue bars denote 2003-04, the red bars illustrate 2014-15, and the green bars, uh, this passes in 2015-16. So it's interesting to see, because of this um, change in practices that the growers adopted, you can see the uh, <clears throat> expense in foliar sprays skyrocketing from $136 per acre to $649. Now, given the decreasing yield, growers are really not able to keep up with this level of expense. So you can see this, that this past season, it went down from $649 to $490 per acre. It is also interesting to see in this figure how tree replacement went from $69 per acre to $231, and this past season, $392. And this is because of the impact that the disease has on mortality of trees. And uh, this last graph shows um, basically economic returns. The um, orange line denotes the, the cultural cost of production, the red line total cost of production, and the two green lines, the revenue for Valencia and non-Valencia varieties of oranges. You can see that in the, far, in the uh, past four seasons, they haven't been making any money on average, um, particularly in 2015-16. They are even down to uh, below, being below the orange line. Okay, so this was the first part, the introduction. I'm going to move on to the second part, pest mobility and area-wide pest management. So the management of pest populations by farmers on their own is the most widely used strategy for pest control. Basically, if we are facing an immobile pest, what happens in the farm stays in the farm. But this is not the case with pest mobility. It is compromising that uh, strategy, making it ineffective. It is precisely due to that mobility that pests can actually be viewed as common property. So neighboring growers share the pest. The damage is dependent not only on that particular um, farm pest population, but on the regional pest population. So then individual pest management results in the under provision of pest control from the point of view of society. By coordinating the pest control, farmers may actually internalize what economists refer to as an externality. So let me define what an externality is. An externality occurs basically when one economic agent, it could be a producer or it could be a consumer, affects the activities of another economic agent, again, a producer or a consumer. And what that means is that basically that 
it is not reflected in the market. That is why we use the word externality, because it's external to it. So that means that it's not reflected in market prices, and because of that, what happens is that it results in, a, in an inefficient uh, outcome. To give you an example, uh, think about a factory uh, producing widgets. And in this process, the factory might be polluting a water stream. Now also assume that there is no abatement technology or regulation that makes the company do it. And so in this production process, what happens is that the company is only taking into account the private cost of that widget, and so that, is not, that, that, that pollution is not reflected in the market price that the consumer pays. So we users of that water stream may be recreational or another factory down, um, down the river that needs clean water are being affected and they are not being sort of compensated for. In our case, the externality is that a grower that is not controlling as much for the pest is affecting the one that is because that harboring of the vector is affecting his own activity. So area-wide pest management in Florida um, is, um, they are basically known for the case of um, um, ACP control as citrus health management areas or CHIMAs. They were created in uh, 2010 as part of the strategic plan for citrus industry to address HLB and they are basically voluntary grouping of growers to coordinate insecticide application timing and mode of action. So the idea is that they all control what is going on in neighboring commercial citrus groves. And they're uh, uniform in the structure and approach. The main costs are just those of spraying and coordinating, which is mostly done by email. And so there are no coordination, organization, or fixed cost associated with it. So the objectives of our study are basically two. First, to analyze whether citrus yields of blocks located in those chimas with higher level of participation attain greater economic benefits, and uh, second, to examine citrus growers' preferences and attitudes towards these chimas. So what I'm going to do next is start to describe the conceptual or theoretical model that we used, and this is going to involve just a bit of math. Uh, if you get bothered by it, just ignore the math and listen to what I have to say, uh, but it, it's just a couple of slides. So to illustrate the pest management externality across neighboring farms, consider two adjacent growers and assume that all inputs uh, besides those of pest control are identical. And by doing that, we can just focus on pest control and ignore the rest uh, of the other costs. So the individual profit functions of growers A and B highlight that insects and cultural practices uh, of neighboring producers can affect each other. And so this is what equation two, one and two are saying. So we have pi, which denotes uh, profit in economics, is equal to P, the price of oranges, times a production function. In the case of grower A, we have that it is affected by not only the level of pest control of uh, that grower, XA, but also of grower B. And so once we have price and uh, yield, basically the result of that production function, we have revenue. We subtract the second term. The cost are the price of the um, pest control input and the level of input XA. Now again, typically growers do not coordinate the use of inputs with their neighbors. They, use, uh, they, they choose that level of input uh, according to their own maximizing of their profit. So what happens is that they optimize in a way that does not take into account their neighbor. So we have the uh, partial derivative of that profit with respect to the level of input. And this gives uh, price times that der partial derivative of uh, that production function with respect to the uh, level of input minus R. So we would take, if we take R to the other side of the equation, we have marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Once again, the key feature here is that this disregards the input choice affecting also the neighbor. And so since the two equations are uh, symmetric, it is the same uh, process for grower B. Now it's different 
under area-wide pest management because farmers do coordinate their efforts and so a joint maximization takes place instead. In equation five, we can see that the first four terms are identical to the ones before. They are just added up together. And we also have two additional terms that are uh, denoting the cost of coordination efforts across the two growers. So here, the first order conditions are given by equations six and seven, and the first part of those two are just identical to the ones we saw earlier, but we have two uh, additional terms um, in parentheses that denote that now the marginal profits to farmers B and A are taken into account. So if that second part of the equation is positive, it denotes that this solution is actually going to be better than the individual profit maximization. Okay, so this was all the math. Um, now the data. We had yield data for two sets of uh, Valencia orange blocks located in different Chimas. The first set was uh, six blocks comprising 221 acres located in Chima 1, and the second set five blocks uh, with 161 acres located in Chima 2. We had data on annual yields by block for crop years 2008-9 to 2014-15. The two Chimas are located in neighboring counties in central Florida, and they have comparable management and climatic conditions. In fact, the key feature of this data is that the same grower owns all the blocks, and so they are all managed under the same practices and have similar characteristics. The deferring treatment in this case is the level of participation. Chima 2 has substantially higher participation. The grower estimates that it has three to five times uh, greater participation compared to Chima 1. As a consequence of that higher level of participation, uh, the average number of ACP per block by Chima uh, is shown on the screen. So you can see that Chima 1, the blue line, has, um, with a few exceptions, a much higher level of ACP compared to the orange line, which denotes Chima 2, the one that has higher level of participation. So the analysis. The first objective, again, was to test our hypothesis that Chimas with higher level of participation attains greater economic benefit. So the first test was, okay, um, check whether there were any differences in mean deal before the Chimas were established established so that we have a fair comparison. So you can see that from the t-test uh, we, we failed to reject that null, so they have um, similar uh, mean yields before they were established. So the second step is, well, now check whether there is any yield dif difference after establishing the chimas. So to do the analysis, we run a couple of regressions. The dependent variable was yield, and the independent or explanatory variables were a bunch of dummy variables. The first set were the years. And so since there were no extreme uh, weather events like hurricanes or freezes, this is going to allow us to measure the effect of HLB on that first Chima, Chima 1. Because the second set of dummies was the interaction between Chima 2 and the year. And so this will allow us to uh, check whether there was any significant, significant uh, difference in yield between the two Chimas. And so we ran uh, basically two models. The random effect model, which has nothing to do with uh, a random experimental design. This is just accounting for the fact that we had panel data, meaning that we had the same blocks uh, through time. And the second regression, pooled OLS with clustered standard errors. Um, we found that actually the same variables uh, were statistically significant. And so uh, we chose to work with the random effect model because it was slightly less favorable, less favorable to that Chima 2. And so illustrating the results in a perhaps more clear way, uh, we have the yield for Chima 1, the yield for Chima 2, and the differences that were statistically significant. So, to answer the question, do yields differ after establishing the Chimas? Yes. Uh, and if we multiply those yields by the price, what we get is the differential revenue. And if we take into account the costs for application, aerial or ground, and the material cost, then we can calculate the differential yield if there was an aerial application or a ground application. And so the cumulative uh, profit for the grower, uh, as you can see, 
is uh, positive. Yet another way of illustrating this with a graph would be the following. We have the, uh, again the um, orange line denoting yields for TMA2 measured on the left hand side vertical axis, the blue line denoting the yield for TMA1. And uh, you can see that starting 2011-12 both start to decrease, but it is much steeper for the blue line. The gray bars denoted on the um, right hand side vertical axis denote that differential revenue. And so what this is saying is that we have evidence that well performing TMAs can enhance growers' profitability. In fact, from an economic point of view, if uh, there is a differential benefit of joining a group, uh, then the farmer should join the group. But in 2015, there were 55 chimas in Florida. Only 19 were active. So the participation is not commensurate with what our finding. So in order to learn more about what was going on, we conducted a survey to gather data on chima participation. And a total of 123 growers represented 153,000 acres participated in that survey. And that is roughly one third of the acreage in the citrus industry. The first question that we asked was, do you participate in chimas? And 38% uh, of the growers said, no, we do not. 62% said that they do. And so we asked a bit more, and uh, those that participated, to what extent do you participate? So every time the Chima captain or leader sends an email to coordinate, do you participate? And this is what they said. 40% of the growers said, yes, we participate all the time. But that means that 60%, the majority, do not. So why is there so much disparity in Chima participation? What are the issues? And so we started asking a bit more, uh, first to non-Chima participants, what are the reasons for not participating? And so we presented them with a um, number of statements and asked them to rank them from one disagree to five agree. The first statement was, neighbors do not participate. And so the majority, 57%, agreed with that statement. And so this is saying, I don't participate because they don't participate. Then we asked them, well, maybe it's too much effort to participate or to coordinate. 43%, the majority said, no, it's not that. We disagree. Also 43% said, no, it's not because it's too costly. 45% disagreed also with, no, it's no longer useful. So we're fine there. But 50%, the majority said, we prefer to spray in our own timing. And this denotes further reluctance to rely on the neighbors. Maybe they are exiting the industry, but no, they disagree with that. 75 said, no, it's not that. And even though the opinions were a bit more divided, still the majority, 35%, said that the benefit is not worth it. So uh, once again, the top reason for them not to participate in Chimas was that the neighbors are not participating, and the second top reason was that uh, they prefer to spray on their own timing. Then we ask uh, similar state, uh, questions or statements to GEMA participants, uh, but in this case denoting what the obstacles to increase GEMA effectiveness were. We presented again with, well, neighbors don't participate. And you can see that again, the majority, 53%, are saying, uh, yeah, we agree with that. They somewhat agree with uh, the, the, the statement, it is too much effort to coordinate, and that it is too costly to spray, and that it is decreasingly effective to spray for the silids. That is what our results show too. And also that the benefit is decreasing, which is also one of our findings. So it is clear from the survey responses that coordination has been an issue for the establishment and correct operation of the chimas. In fact, the responses suggest that the problem is strategic uncertainty. And what this means is that the uh, beliefs regarding the actions of the neighbors present growers with a problem. They do not know what the neighbor is going to do. So while facing that issue, they decide to do their own thing. And so this is a key 
uh, aspect that they take into account when deciding whether to spray or not. Another interesting thing happened last year. In March of 2016, the Florida Commissioner of Agriculture declared a citrus crisis across the state. The goal of this was to allow growers across the state to use, um, I put antibacterials because they decided that it was less controversial than using the word antibiotics, but it really is antibiotics. And so they allowed for the use of antibiotics in foliar applications in the attempt to enhance the health of HLB-infected trees. Now the issue is that this enhancement is not really proven yet, and so this provides more evidence of this dire situation that the Florida growers are facing. Interestingly enough, the ACP population data suggests that the declaration has had an unintended side effect. And so, um, going back to our uh, previous graph, you can see the spike, the big spike in the number, the average number of ACP in the two tumors that we had data for. And this occurred just after that declaration. And this is not something that is only uh, uh, happening in these two tumors, but actually across the entire uh, state. So this spike, like I said, uh, occurred just after that uh, declaration, and so this suggests that growers are replacing the insecticide uh, sprays with anti, um, antibiotics. So in other words, growers are getting away from that strategic uncertainty that Chimas pose, and they decide to take instead the risky or uncertain result that antibiotics provide, evidently because they uh, perceive that to be lower than the strategic uh, interaction that they would need to go through if they decide to go with the Chimas. Now, to be fair, there are other factors that may have contributed to the spike in ACP counts, and maybe uh, there's a bit of itch. So there was a um, rainy, uh, it was a rainy spring last season, and also there, there may be some insecticide-resistant development, perhaps because they are not coordinating their sprays. So antibiotics do uh, present growers with an alternative to uh, combat HLB, but it is still unclear whether they will prove effective uh, and they actually seem to have had uh, a side effect on Chimas. The basic tenet for the use of antibacterials uh, or biotics to, to manage HLB is that they require little coordination among growers. They can do their own thing, and as we saw earlier, it is what they like doing. If though, uh, they are found to be unable to enhance the uh, health of the infected trees, this is going to uh, cause a problem and hamper the chances to control HLB with the Chimas. So to um, start summarizing the findings uh, with respect to objective one, we found that the yield is decre uh, decreased significantly from 2012-13 through 2014-15, uh, and this denotes the increase in impact of HLB. The yields of logs in Chimas with higher uh, level of participation resulted in 28, 73, and 98% higher um, um, level of yield in 2012, 13, 13, 14, and 14, 15, and uh, a significant gross differential benefit per acre. We also saw a partial offset in a, uh, effect against uh, the impact of HLB over time, and this provides that um, efficiency of well-performing Chimas to deal with the disease. Regarding the objective two, the top reason for not participating in Chimas again was this belief about neighbors not participating. The second top reason, uh, the self-reliance preference. And so uh, th this presents growers with strategic uncertainty. And despite the high benefit that Chimas can provide, this issue uh, of relying on neighbors seems to impose too high of a cost to those growers who end up not coordinating their sprays. So the policy implications of, of um, our uh, findings are uh, the following. First, uh, we suggest that instead of being voluntary, Chimas should be mandatory uh, in commercial citrus growth across the state. So growers would be assessed a per acre charge um, of the sprays. Uh, maybe subsidies may contribute to reduce the potential controversy of making them mandatory. Uh, now the big question is, well, 
shall a community-based approach that is growers organizing themselves be used or a top-down regulation from the government. The second policy implication is the introduction of monitoring and sanctions for those that are not complying. The third is the introduction of uh, in-kind transfers among growers to complement CHIMAS and achieve appropriate levels of participation. This has been shown to uh, be working in Brazil. And so basically what happens in Brazil is that large growers are finding that the main issue is in the borders of their groves. And so they are starting to control for the ECP beyond their, their borders. They are spraying their neighbors for free. They are even, uh, if they have residential people that have uh, citrus uh, trees in their backyard, what they do is they either offer them to spray the trees or they provide um, another uh, fruit tree to them and, and take down the, the citrus tree for them to, uh, to compensate them. Uh, this would be also useful to complement the current Florida uh, state uh, efforts for the removal of abandoned acreage, which is a huge problem. There are uh, approximately 100,000 acres of abandoned citrus groves because growers are simply not able to keep up with the level of expense, and so they, uh, they leave the, the, the groves there because if they take them down, they immediately are under uh, the, that deduction in uh, taxes is, um, is, is cut. So they prefer to leave the citrus groves and keep that exemption on the land. And uh, the government perhaps could further incentivize, incentivize growers uh, to make those transfers by declaring them eligible for some, sor some form of uh, tax break. And finally, uh, maybe use a, uh, processes that support communication and learning among farmers as an incentive for them to adopt sustainable practices more permanently rather than only during the duration of the program. So uh, this concludes my presentation. I uh, thank you for your attention. I really thank Andrew for inviting me uh, to, to present today.